Thank you, Kim. Welcome to the Sound of Everything Park Club. Excuse my voice, I'm just getting over the flu. So I have, I have an elephant. Now I just have a frog in my throat. So just please bear with me. Um, first, I'd like to thank Annie Crandall uh, and Annie Chaper Crandall, who's at the front desk. She is the program chair, and it's been great working with her. And I'm very excited to put this program together with Annie. To start the hot topics for art professionals through the eyes of art lawyers, I'd like to present our uh, panelists. To my far left is Rosanna Rosine. She's the founder of Rosanna Rosine Law, a New York law firm serving the legal needs of families and creative professionals. Rosanna concentrates on the trust of estates and elder law with a special focus on planning for arts. She was a member of the New York uh, State Bar Association's Elder Law and its Trust in the State sections. She is also a board member of Brighton LA Theater, a nonprofit Russian ballet school in Brighton Beach. Welcome, welcome again. David Paw, principal of the law offices of David H. Paw, emphasizing intellectual property law, entertainment, fashion, art law, as well as business law. David is the editor of the American Bar Association's Legal Guide to Fashion Design and chair of the ABA's Copyright Committee on Visual Arts and Dramatic Works. Welcome, David. Judith Prouda, attorney, mediator, and arbit uh, arbitrator, focused in art law, copyright, entertainment, and commercial law. And she's the author of Visual Arts and the Law, a handbook, handbook for professionals. She is also a senior editor, a uh, senior lecturer at Sotheby's Institute of Art. Welcome. Thank you. Last but not least, Douglas Wasser. Doug is the partner in the law firm of Wasser and Rust, located in the financial district of New York City. Specialized in real estate and business transactions, but Doug in particular has brought art law to his firm. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to start this out Thank with you. one question, and you each have two minutes to answer it. Oh. With the idea that it focuses on your specialty. Starting with Doug, what is art law? Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Annie, uh, for uh, organizing uh, the panel tonight. Uh, what is art law? I get that question a lot. Uh, I'm, as Pat said, I'm a real estate lawyer. Uh, but uh, we, I have a passion for art law. When uh, I tell people I'm an art lawyer, I usually get the looks, a uh, couple of uh, uh, blinks, and uh, people look at me like I have two heads. Um, <clears throat> my focus in art law is mostly on the litigation end, where we've litigated mostly uh, ownership uh, title issues. But art law itself brings is really uh, what we call a multi multidisciplinary field. Uh, where uh, a lot of different specialty specialties, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of different expertise uh, comes into play. Um, uh, it's not divorce law where you go to a divorce lawyer. It's not uh, tax law where you go to a tax lawyer. It comes from all over the place, different different areas. And I think we have uh, very four four good panelists tonight from four different uh, uh, four different perspectives to offer. Uh, the room, and uh, it'll be a fun night to see uh, how uh, what we take to the issues. Judith, what would you like to add? Okay, well, I agree with what you said. Um, it's it's um, art law pertains to any any aspect of art, from the creation of art to the the moment the art enters the market, um, in the primary market to the secondary market when when a work is resold. Um, and it continues on through the lifetime of a work of art. It may be forged, it may be stolen, um, it, um, it may be bequeathed, donated, um, and it, it, it really every aspect of, of the work, um, beginning with a creation, copyright, um, the creation of art. And, and the fact that a work is, is considered art <coughs> Has a very, very big effect on on the on the work. If it's a work of art, then it uh, would not be subject to certain taxes. You would be able to donate it to a museum, 
deduct taxes. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating field, and um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Annie, for inviting me, and, and Pat for, for uh, moderating this panel. I look forward to discussing it with you. And David? The kinds of things I do with art law, I'm a very copyright-heavy lawyer, so a lot of what I do is try to help the artist distinguish between the idea and the expression of that idea. The expression of that idea is uh, what's protectable. The idea itself, anybody can do. We can all do a sculpture based on the same idea and the sculptures will be the same, uh, completely different. Um, but as a lawyer, I, I have to be a little bit uh, uh, of a jerk about it and try to expand the expression of the idea as much as possible into the idea itself on behalf of my clients. So the kinds of contracts I might do would be licensing to say that this this is what you're getting for, um, you know, this is the scope, the geographic scope of the art. If you if it's a writer who's getting replaced, I might um, say, well, a replacement writer uh, will be basing their work on the same ideas and the same expressions of those ideas, so the first writer would have to get a piece of that. Uh, other things have to do with employees and interns saying these are trade secrets and if my if my client's doing a, a sculpture and you're helping this client you can't go and imitate his style style's a very t difficult thing to protect in reality um, so that's essentially what I do is a lot of contracts a lot of registrations of copyright and making sure that the portfolio has a, a solid paper trail of ownership and, and of the contours of what we're protecting. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, thank you, Annie and Pat, um, for, for hosting this event tonight. Um, so uh, conversations that I have often with clients are about planning for death or disability, and getting to work with artists gives me a chance to talk to them about how, what, what their artistic legacy will be. So it actually, I think, gives me um, something that is um, a little less doom and gloom because that's what's so amazing about being an artist is that you get to actually think about your, you can live on after you're physically not here anymore. And um, having the opportunity to work with visual artists or anybody who has any type of um, art uh, that they want to continue to live and to plan for that, I think, is um, important. And so that's... That's my perspective on the art love people. Thank you. David, can you give us your thoughts on the importance of copyright? Yeah. Um, yeah, the importance of copyright for an artist. When I, whether I'm handling somebody who's uh, on Broadway or in a gallery or uh, in, a, in a major showroom in, in uh, Bloomingdale's, a fashion designer, all these people have the same issue where they were trained very much at, um, at the craft of their trade. They went to school and, just, uh, uh, and they learned about their craft. And they learned nothing about the business. Now, I have an acronym that I use, uh, which is PLEB. These are plebeian professions because it's P-L-E-B, painter, lawyer, electrician, boxer. They all have the same issues. Boxers learn how to box. They don't learn how to read a contract. They don't know how to do a deal. Electricians, when the electrician walks into your house, the, the new electrician, he doesn't know how much to charge you. Nobody told him this is how much you charge and this is how much you can uh, uh, get away with charging somebody. Uh, my, my plumber is a much better negotiator than I will ever be because <laughs> I pay him for whatever he says because I need him to answer the phone, right? Lawyers are the same way. When I left law school, I didn't know how to get... Uh, in the proper insurance or how to do workers' compensation if I got an employee or how much to bill, how much could I bill reasonably and honestly. And I think artists are the same way. Um, so it's important to learn the business side of your trade as well. Uh, that's what's going to get you through the tough times is when somebody's pressuring you uh, to sign a gallery contract and there's a clause in that gallery contract that says the gallery... Uh, hereby owns the copyright, you should know that that's not appropriate. Or if you get a work for hire contract and it says, well, this is a work for hire, and if for some reason it's not considered a work for hire, you hereby assign all the copyright over to me. Well, it's important to know that you're probably not signing a work for hire agreement. 
I don't care how big the typeface is uh, as the title, it's not work for hire, it's an assignment. And that language saying, if for some reason it's not considered a work for hire, that's a red herring, that's a distraction, that's, that's a, a magician's trick. Uh, so knowing about copyright uh, is very important to the artist, and it's, it's the basis, uh, it's even, this, even the works that are not major in your portfolios are the, could, they could be the annuities that get you through your later years. They could be a grocery bill for a month. They could be a, a, an electri electricity bill for a month. You never know what's going to happen. And as I'm, I'm sure that um, Roseanne is going to talk about, if you sign away your copyright, you're not just signing it away for you. Your copyright lasts for your lifetime plus 70 years. So you sign away your copyright, you might be signing away your, grand, uh, your grandchild's college fund. You just don't know. Okay, Judith. What are the three essential legal concepts that everyone in the art world should know? Um, the first lesson I would say is uh, don't just shake on it, put it in writing. Um, in the case of artists and dealers, for example, the idea of executing a written contract seems crassly commercial for such a unique and near mythic personal relationship. Since the art world's culture is based on trust, where deals are often sealed with a handshake, there's a natural aversion to a formal written document that's outlining the obligations of the artist and the dealer. However, this notion is as ro romantic as it is unrealistic, because the artist-dealer relationship is, is essentially a business arrangement. And without the benefits of a written document, each side lacks a full understanding of the other's needs. And even a minor problem can escalate to a major dispute. It is far easier to address confusion at an early stage when the parties at least are trying to make the relationship successful rather than later after a problem has arisen. Also, the contractual process can be an important tool um, to clarify the party's ex expectations of the relationship. Usually, a simple letter of understanding will suffice because it obligates the parties to spell out important terms, averting later confusion and misinterpretation. In addition uh, to protecting the artist and dealer, a written agreement protects third parties. If for, an example, if, for example, an artist consigns a work to a gallery, which later declares bankruptcy, a written agreement acknowledging the intentions of the parties can save time and money by proving that the works were consigned to the gallery by the artist and are not subject to the gallery's creditors. To put it simply, oral contracts work well until they don't. <laughs> the possibility of misunderstanding of, of, over responsibilities and expectations become fuel for discord and cause, may cause the relationship to unravel. If a dispute can be resolved amicably through discussion and negotiation of the agreement, the agreement becomes critical. Another consideration is the statute of frauds, which requires that certain agreements must be in writing in order to be enforceable. Contracts for, sale of, for the sale of goods over $500, for example, must be in writing to be enforceable, and that is probably the case with many artworks. Agreements that contain a promise that cannot be fully performed within a year of the agreement also must be in writing, or it is not enforceable. To prove the existence of an oral contract can be, can be formidable when a dispute arises. And more, moreover, if an agreement is not in writing, a contract is implied rather than expressed, and its terms will be provided by the legal system rather than the parties themselves. As, as an illustrious scholar in art law, 
Professor Merriman from, from Stanford observed, if you want a bad contract instead of a good one, the law will supply it for you. <laughs> if you want a good one, you must make it yourselves. So the key terms, I would say, to include in an artist-dealer agreement are exclu exclusivity, the payment, of course, of the, of the dealer's commission, payment to the artist, the territory of representation, the copyright, insurance, shipping, title, um, meaning ownership, renewal, and termination. In addition, a one-page, simple one-page consignment contract signed by the artist and dealer for each consignment transaction should refer to the artist-dealer agreement and specify the works that are consigned, the sales prices of each work, and the duration of a specific consignment. So how many minutes do I have left? Oh, that's it. Okay. Well, I have three more lessons. If you want to talk to me later, I will tell, tell you about them. Maybe we can, right? Rosanna, I was going to ask you a question, but I think I'm going to leave it up to you. Because the, the question I was going to ask her is more, it hit me personally, and it has, it also highlights the new movie with jo and Julianne Moore about Silent um, Alice. It's the incapacitation of your mind, all right? And so many people are suffering from this, and it's going to get worse. So I was going to ask you, what should I do or anyone do if it happens to me in the future? What do you do? How do you trust find someone to trust your work who knows my art to step in and manage my personal and artistic affairs? If you don't want to address that, you can pick your own question. Um, well, I mean, a big part of the work that I do is planning for disability, which would be incapacity, um, while you're alive, and then also planning for the next stages you know, when a person passes away, what happens to your property then. So I'm happy to talk about it um, because I think it's extremely important and it's about your dignity. Um, and so I think that I, I'm happy that you are raising this question. Um, and it is always in the news. Um, there was, anyway, so planning for disability is, is actually could be fairly straightforward. Um, there are documents that are called advanced directives um, where people can basically um, choose people to make decisions on their behalf. And, they, and that's for medical decisions, you have healthcare proxy. And for financial decisions, you have a power of attorney. And a power of attorney um, is a document that should be generally done with an, with an attorney because there's many ways to modify it. And from the perspective of an artist or anybody, um, you can put specific clauses in your power of attorney to even specify who would be in charge of negotiating contracts on your behalf um, if you were to become incapacitated. And it's, it's a very important document to think through um, and you can separate your personal. So for instance, I've worked with people who might choose an agent under the power of attorney who would manage their personal affairs, so paying their bills or doing real estate transactions. But that person might not necessarily have the expertise to manage their business affairs or their artistic affairs. Um, so you might specify a different person to do that. Um, and so a power of attorney form, it's, it's on the one hand not a complicated document, on the other hand um, it can do so much. Um, it does not even have to be when a person becomes incapacitated. There's, uh, you can have a power of attorney and agent step in even if, for instance, a person is temporarily um, undergoing surgery and they're just not physically able to, to do something um, or they're traveling. So there's many ways that it can be tailored to meet the specific needs. And it really goes into doing all the things that everyone here is talking about, negotiating contracts, um, entering into business deals, even going in, into your checking account to pay your bills. Um, so that's a power of attorney. Uh, but there are more sophisticated ways to do that type of planning for disability, and that would include something such as setting up a living trust. And I think if people have artwork that they um, want to plan both for them the next step, which is you know once, once they pass, Setting up a trust is one way to 
um, have all of your assets in one place with trustees who are managing it, and then there's a more um, seamless transition once the person dies. Do I have a few minutes to talk about the next stage, or are we? Yes. Okay. Um, but I, in planning for um, when a person dies, when I speak with artists about their artistic legacy, and I've worked with people who don't necessarily have, their, their artwork may not be valuable right now. Um, and I love working with those people because I think the idea is that you don't know. I don't know if anyone here, um, I know that Elizabeth knows, uh, there was an article a few months ago about Vivian Mayer, the photographer. And so during her life, her photos didn't have much value, but when she died, they skyrocketed um, for different reasons, but she didn't plan. She died in test date without a will. Um, and now, basically, her estate is who's going to inherit her estate is being decide, decided by the laws of um, Illinois. I think that's the theme that we're having tonight. You know, if you don't plan, you don't put it in writing, then the government or you know, the laws are going to decide how, what's gonna happen. And that's essentially what's happening right now. Um, I mean, her, her, her story is even more complicated because somebody bought um, at an auction some of her, um, the negatives um, at a very um, small price and sort of invested in giving her a name, and now her um, photos have a much higher value, and he also um, sort of bought the rights from one of her distant heirs. Um, and so there's a question of who owns her work, who owns the copyright, and it's also possible that her work may not be in display in galleries. They, they had to actually take down all her work from the galleries and stop selling it because her estate is, everyone's disputing who owns it, and so, I think that's a perfect example of what happens when you don't do a will. Um, and a will could be a very simple, it's, a, it's also it could be a fairly straightforward document. Um, it could just be naming who inherits your work and who would be the executor or the trustee to manage it. And it may be the same person that would be doing your personal um, affairs, and it may not be. Um, you know, I, that's, it's a question of if you are naming your spouse, does your spouse have the capabilities of understanding how to manage your artistic work, um, they may not. And so, um, so I think that's probably the most salient point is, you know, put it in writing. Okay. Thank you. Have, have you seen any significant case of war developments in 2014? Thank you, Pat. Uh, 2014 was a fun year uh, in the litigation world uh, for, for art. Um, and there were a lot of developments in a lot of different areas. What I really want to do in the 10 minutes allotted uh, is just lightly, and I'm afraid it has to be a very, very light touch on three cases. Um, those three cases uh, speak to uh, the art advisor, the art consultant, same thing, perhaps, um, and the people who engage them. Um, and uh, uh, the most, uh, the, the case with the largest amount of publicity, uh, the, big, uh, the big kahuna was uh, Larry Kagosian and Ron Perlman. Uh, Larry Kagosian, of course, being Larry Kagosian, uh, and Ron Perlman being uh, at least listed in Forbes uh, this year as number 59 in terms of the richest people on this planet. Um, Gagosian uh, is Perelman's uh, art advisor for 20 years. Um, Gagosian also had and has a special relationship with Jeff Koons. And Gagosian approaches Perelman and says, uh, Jeff Koons is doing a Popeye series, a Popeye sculpture series, and uh, you can have one of them, a black granite Popeye sculpture for four million bucks. Perelman loves it. Because uh, he knows he can buy it and he can immediately resell it for uh, a multiple of four million bucks. Uh, in fact, I think there was a stainless steel Popeye sculpture that sold this past May at Sotheby's for twenty-eight million. So uh, this, the reasoning was sound. Uh, so Perelman says, "Great, we're going to enter into some sort of." Uh, he enters into paperwork to get this Popeye sculpture. Uh, from Coons and uh, Gagosian um, neglects to advise Perelman of one small insignificant fact, 
and that is that uh, he had, uh, Gagosian had entered into certain commitments which effectively take him out of the resale of that sculpture from participating in the resale of that sculpture for five years. And since Gagosian is the guy to sell Kuhn's works, uh, Parliament is stuck with a significantly impaired value for the Popeye sculpture. Well, thanks a lot, Larry. I uh, guess you should, I would appreciate it if you'd told me that before I committed to spend $4 million for the piece. Um, Gozian says, we'll make it up, and they proceed for the next year and a half to engage in a whole slew of painting swaps and sculpture swaps a Lichtenstein sculpture, a, a couple of de Kooning's, a uh, Cy Twombly, back and forth and back and forth, price adjustments and the like, at the end of which uh, Gozian presumably says to Perlman, okay, are you happy now? And Perlman says, no, you, Mr. Gagosian, uh, picked, uh, determined the value of these uh, exchanges, the value of these swaps by yourself, uh, and you kind of picked these values out of thin air. You have been my art advisor for 20 years. You owe me a duty of loyalty. You owe me a fiduciary duty. You just can't treat me as if I'm a customer walking into the gallery off the street for the first time. The court said, yeah, he kind of can. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the court held trial court issued its ruling in January. Uh, the appellate court came down a little bit uh, harder against Perelman in December, good way to bookend the year on the issue. On, and uh, the holding was simply because one party uh, has a little bit more expertise in an area, Gagosian is smarter, wiser in the art world than uh, Perelman. That doesn't mean that creates, that doesn't create a fiduciary duty simply because Gagosian has been Perelman's art advisor for 20 some odd years. That doesn't create a fiduciary duty. So, score one for the art advisor. Uh, second case is a little bit south of that, and that's in Brooklyn. Um, and while everyone has heard about the Gagosian Parliament case, no one has heard about Louis Saul versus Cahan, C A H N. We don't have anyone here in the audience involved in the case here, do we? No? Good. I can speak <laughs> freely. Um, Suffice it to say that this was, uh, let's just say that this was uh, an art client, art advisor relationship that went south. Uh, once again, the uh, art client sues the art advisor. You owe me fiduciary duty. You steered me wrong. You just couldn't treat me like uh, like someone in off the street. The uh, uh, court said uh, no fiduciary duty, uh, no special duty of loyalty. So uh, score two for the uh, art advisor. Uh, interesting. This court talked about the art advisor relationship. And said that's and, and following a theme that's going on here tonight, said that that's that's an agreement that needs to be in writing. So without there being a writing, the advisory relationship, if it's used for business purposes, is an unenforceable agreement. So that helped the art advisor in defending against the art client. I'm not sure if we have clients here or art advisors, but um, that. But the next time around. Uh, the art advisor might well be suing for a commission. And uh, that's going to be a tougher thing to secure if, uh, if the art advisor is suing on the basis of uh, an unenforceable oral agreement. So the last of the three cases I wanted to get to was uh, a little bit further south, and that's in Texas, as in uh, deep in the heart of. Um, uh, and there uh, we have Marguerite Hoffman, who is a renowned patron of the arts in Dallas, Texas. And she has this wonderful Rothko piece. Um, but she kind of hints, kind of pledges, kind of promises that she's going to donate that piece to the Dallas Museum of Art. Uh, and everyone in her social circles in Dallas believe that to be the case. Uh, but Rothman, I mean, not Roth, I'm sorry, Hoffman has some other ideas, she decides she wants to sell that piece that everyone thinks she's going to donate. So the dilemma presents itself, uh, and she decides to engage in a secret sale of the piece, the Rothko. Uh, and she also uh, decides that whomever she says, sells this piece to is going to keep that secret. 
uh, so that the uh, word of the sale will never get out. So she negotiates with L&M Gallery, acting on behalf of its client, David Martinez. Uh, L&M Gallery says to Hoffman, don't worry about it. This piece is going to disappear into, uh, Martin, uh, into my client's collection, is really what the quote that he used, uh, into my client's collection. Don't worry about it. We'll never see the light of day. And uh, Hoffman says, fine, sells the uh, Rothko um, for $19 million. Three years later, you guessed it, Martinez decides he wants to sell the Rothko. And he does it at a very public sale, a Sotheby's auction, for $31 million. So kudos to Dave Martinez, a nice, tan, nice tidy $12 million profit over the course of three, three years. But those people who know Rothko's pick up on the fact and say, isn't that the Hoffman Rothko? Um, so Hoffman's a little uh, angry, so Hoffman sues Martinez, Hoffman sues l and Hoffman sues Sotheby's. Uh, this case came down in uh, the summer. Um, uh, case is dismissed against Sotheby's, case is dismissed against Martinez. The only party left standing is l and the advisor, gallery, middleman who did the deal. L&M has to pay $500,000 to Hoffman. Um, and that's because L&M was the only party that had face-to-face -face negotiations with Hoffman. So is there a thematic you know, nugget that we can take from this? Get your agreements if you're an art advisor, if you're an engaged art advisor, get your agreements in writing. What's compensation going to be? What do you expect from the relationship? If there are, uh, for example, if there are multiple opportunities, if there are multiple clients, if, if it does, does the art advisor, do they have to divert all opportunities to the client? Can the art advisor take advantage of an opportunity to the exclusion of the client? Get that all set down in writing. Um, and if you're the advisor, the gallery in the middle, um, uh, and you're negotiating on behalf of a client, get indemnification. Make sure that if the deal heads south somehow, that it's the client that gets to pay the piper and not, and not the conduit, so to speak. L&M did nothing, nothing wrong in that, uh, in that uh, Hoffman case, yet L&M was the only party standing and they were the one that had to pay the piper. <laughs> All right, I'm going to open up the rest of this to the panel. So you can jump in whatever you want to. I'm going to throw a couple of things out there and you give me the response. One word is plagiarism. We've already talked about Coons and Garcon so I'm not going to. Um, there's also a question about art fairs versus galleries and um, art clubs or art dealers. Uh, who's getting hurt by that kind of deal going on? Um, art fairs are opening up more, and I think galleries are suffering. They may or may not. You may want to get into this. Sure. <laughs> um, and I'm bringing it up particularly because, Tim, we have our auctions coming up soon. So I'd like to know auctions, how auctions are being affected by art fairs also. Throw that into the pot, into the conversation. So, anybody can answer things about plagiarism. I know that there was a new case of an artist copying a plagiarizing or copying or painting a politician. No, I don't know. Warhol used to do Campbell soup cans. I don't know why it's so offensive for a politician to have this kind of painting and they feel that it's plagiarized. There's some politicians that even shouldn't have a painting done by him. Okay. Well, our art students. fairs. Well, um, as you probably noticed, art fairs. There's there, there are many art fairs that um, that really um, um, th that are that take place throughout the year, and they are uh, an efficient way for collectors to see a lot of art, um, because there are hundreds of galleries that um, that that are that are at art fairs, and, um, and collectors tend to, um, 
to do, you know, to, to go to an art fair and see a lot of art and rather than go to the, to the brick and mortar um, gallery in New York or Los Angeles or um, elsewhere in the world. So, um, so this has become a, a, quite an extravaganza um, for, um, for collectors and for galleries as well, which make a good part of their income for the year at an art fair. Who loses? Um, I, would, I think the small galleries um, are disadvantaged because they are, it's very hard to get into an art fair. The application fees are very steep and some galleries are really not able to compete. So I think that it, um, that it can be problematic for, the, for, um, for, for younger galleries um, who, um, who really cannot afford to be in an art fair. Also, there are conflicts of interest, potential conflicts of interest, because the, the galleries are also the gatekeepers of, um, in, in, are in selection committees. And they're really deciding who's able to, um, to participate in an art fair. So there, there's, there, there are potential conflicts of interest as well. But this is, a, this is really um, the, the landscape of, um, of the art world as we, as we know it today. There are over 90 art fairs throughout the, throughout the, the calendar year. And, um, and they're, they're so, they're so um, frequent that, that art fair fatigue has set in. I mean, you can go into an art fair. I can tell you what kind of shoes to wear to an art fair if you, if you need to, if you're going to an art fair. Um, but um, I don't know, maybe somebody else would like to jump in and, and I have something to say it. about plagiarism, but... Okay. Yeah, I, that's where I thought... Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> well, in terms of plagiarism, it's, this is sort of the pre... Uh, I can talk about plagiarism in the context of before you need to go to a litigator, so that's kind of what I wanted to go to before you. But the easiest way to protect against uh, plagiarism is registration. And there is a difference between having a copyright, which just takes three things. It takes an authored expression, fixed and tangible form. Uh, that means it has to be original to the author, it has to be an expression, not the idea, and it, ha it can't be just an idea in your head. Uh, it has to be fixed and tangible form, whether it be a, on a canvas or on um, a CD. Uh, and, but registration with the U.S. Copyright Office is different. Um, you register with the Copyright Office, and if you do so, uh, uh, within three months of publication, you get certain benefits. You get attorney's fees if somebody should plagiarize you, and you get, um, uh, what, what else am I uh, Statutory damages. Statutory damages, uh, up to $150,000 per infringement. Uh, if you, if you uh, register within five years then of publication or before an infringement takes place, then you get certain benefits, mainly the prima facie or the presumption that you have a valid copyright. Who cares about the presumption, right? Well, you do, because if you have to prove that you have a valid copyright, that's, that's you paying some lawyer to help you prove that you have a valid copyright. If you have a, a presumption that you have a valid copyright, it's the other person's job to prove you don't have a valid copyright. So it's a money issue. Um, you know, there, there are certain myths about registration, like maybe I can mail something to myself. No, that's just plain old copyright. Uh, maybe uh, there's certain registries in various industries. Maybe I can register my piece. Uh, I even had a, a pretty high level uh, PR agency, somebody who worked at a pretty high level PR agency say, well, I'm putting these photos up and I haven't gotten permission but don't worry, I put it all on YouTube or Instagram first, so it's all in the public domain now. Uh, so you don't want to, you want to ignore all of those myths. Uh, and that's the best way to protect against plagiarism. But one, even, and also you can't even get into court if you don't register your copyright. If somebody plagiarizes you and you go to court, the first thing the judge is going to ask you is let me see the registration. If you don't have a registration, you can go and register the work, but you don't get any of the, uh, of the advantages, of the benefits that I've just talked about. No attorney's fees, no statutory damages. You have to prove you are actually damaged and how much you were damaged. 
How much were you damaged by the, by the photograph that somebody else uh, uh, promoted and claimed as their own? Because they're going to come back and say, this photograph wasn't worth anything if it hadn't been for me promoting it as my own. So you have to prove that you were damaged in a certain amount, and you won't get, any, and you're going to have to prove you had a valid copyright. Um, even once you get into court, you might be facing the very popular issue now between what's a transformative work versus what's a derivative work. Uh, there are five ways to exploit a copyright. There's live performance, which doesn't really play it here. Uh, and there's reproduction, distribution, the right to do a derivative work, and the right to display that work. Uh, obviously, in this room, the, the display is what you're really, um, what you're really uh, uh, licensing. Uh, but if somebody takes, buys your physical painting and then produces postcards out of it, that's an infringement on your copyright, unless you've allowed them a reproduction right as well. Um, yeah, and that's, those are the basic protections of copyright. Uh, Doug, did you have something? No, I was actually going to uh, start talking about uh, uh, the transformative use, but you've touched it, so that's good. So uh, maybe I can... <laughs> I, I can touch it very briefly, considering well, oh, the litigation. Both, we need far more than 10 minutes to talk about <laughs> fair use. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is um, a discussion for all four of you, so I'm not stopping anybody right now. <laughs> um, I thought maybe I'd talk about uh, Eggleston uh, had an interesting case. Uh, this was not in 2014, I think this was in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, um, where uh, Eggleston had some very, um, uh, had some uh, fake, uh, photographs, uh, his famous photographs. Um, and a uh, collector of those Eggleston photo photographs had a, he had a four to six million dollar collection of them. Um, and they were all limited run, uh, multiple uh, photographs. Um, and then Eggleston's, uh, Eggleston's foundation decided, uh, these, were, these were photographs that were maybe from the original run from the 1970s or 1980s or thereabouts. Uh, then uh, he, uh, the foundation decides that uh, they can reproduce those photographs and even though they were sold in, in very, very limited runs and even though they acquired significant value, the foundation decides that they can reproduce those images on their own uh, using current digital technology and sell those photographs again. Is that close enough to the plagiarism type theme that we're talking about? It's, it's also, it's also um, the, the issue was whether it was a violation of the multiples law. Right, right, right. So, so, yeah. uh, so the um, owner of, uh, of, the, of the multiples sued uh, and lost. Um, and uh, I think pretty much the holding is uh, that uh, the artist foundation owns the image and uh, limited, uh, a limited run, a multiple run is good. The, the, it contains whatever number of multiples are in that run, whatever number of images are in that run and then it, that's that. That's true and also it was, an, it, it was the same image but it was, it was, it was not expanding the, um, the limited edition of, the, of, of that, the, that image. Right. Um, the uh, the new um, the new image was a different medium, so that's so that's why it was not really a, a violation of the multiples law. He he um, he wrote on the on, on each of the limited edition one of two of and 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 did never and never reproduced any more than that. So so technically speaking, he was not in violation of the multiples law, and he did own the, the copyright to the image. I did have one other remark to make about copyright, and that is um, that's a common misperception that when you buy a work of art, you you also own the copyright. That is that is incorrect. There is a distinct there's there is um, there's a distinction between the physical work and the copyright in the work. So when you buy a work of art, what you're buying is the object. You're not buying the, the copyright. On the object that that copyright remains with the with the artist and is very rarely 
transferred. I mean, I've never seen it transferred and unless somebody She's signs seen it transferred. She's, okay. Well, some, <laughs> right? Okay, sometimes... The heirs. Some, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's exactly the... Yeah. Yes, okay. But, and what you were, you were also talking about, um, d d yeah, deciding to you transfer... You see a lot of, of, um, of people reproducing a work of art because they think that they bought the copyright when in fact right. they bought... The, it's not a sale, it's a license to display. A license is a rental, it's just another, I'm renting this for the rest of my life, or, and then I'll pass it down. It's, it can be a very long rental period, but that's all it is. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a purchase of the copyright. That's right, you own the object. So if you, if you were thinking of, um, of um, inviting your family to sit in front of this beautiful painting that you, just, that you bought and, and to create um, greeting cards with, you know, with the painting in the background, you could be in violation, or you would be in violation, of the copyright of that, of that artist unless, the, of course, the work is in the public domain. So, um, so this, is a, this is a common um, misperception, and that was another one of my lessons. So mm -hmm. that comes into play with the museums that make posters, reproduction posters. Of course. Yeah. Right, they have another license. They have something yeah. additional that allows them to do that. And to add, I mean, so that's, that's exactly, I mean, when a person is thinking about when they're doing their will or thinking about their estate plan, one of the considerations is exactly that. Like if you're the artist and this is your artwork, you have a choice of what, if you're, be, you're making a bequest and you could give the actual art piece together with the copyright or separate it. And then also the IRS will value for estate and gift tax purposes, they will actually put a separate value to the tangible art piece and the, the copyright. So that's, yeah, important point. Can I ask a question of the audience? Sure, they're going to ask you in a couple of seconds. Okay, well, <laughs> I get in my heads there's first. There's another question that has just come up, that the artist resale rights bill is still in the U.S. Congress. Would someone like to enlighten us on its significance to artists and galleries? Okay. It's I'm, controversial. So, yeah, but, okay, well, um, I, I can begin. Yeah, I was just, I was just on a... <laughs> <laughs> um, we were talking about this earlier, and um, I, I actually moderated a panel this, week, uh, th this past week for the Copyright Society um, on, on this very topic, and it's, um, it... it um, Congressman Nadler is one of the, um, is the sponsor of the, of the bill that's going to be reintroduced to this Congress. Um, this bill would pro is proposing that, um, that an artist would be able to obtain a royalty on the resale of that, of that work, um, and uh, such as a royalty that, that other kinds of create, other, other creative uh, people receive when, the, when a book is sold. When a book is sold, the author of that book will receive a royalty. And, but this is not the case with an artist. When the artist sells the work, and the work later on um, goes, in, it's, it's, it's sold to the, to the, in the first, in the primary market, then eventually perhaps that, um, that owner will resell it. Under the resale royalty scheme, that the seller would be required to pay a royalty to the artist back. Okay, so that's the that's the idea of it. So there, of course, there are pros and cons. Um, one one of the arguments is just what I is just what I mentioned to you is that you know the artist is you know the, the starving artist ar argument that the artist sells works at an early stage of the career and does not reap the benefits of the um, of the uh, the accumulation of of, um, of, um, of value when a work is resold, similar to what you know what you were talking about about you know reselling coons, and, 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 mm -hmm. you know, so so the artist would not would not gain um, a profit, and um, and there was, there was a very famous sale in 1973. Robert Skull, who was a taxi baron, was selling his collection of con of contemporary art. And in the room were several contemporary artists, including Robert Rauschenberg. And somebody's nodding, maybe you know about the story. And um, several of Rauschenberg's works sold at m multiples of what Skull had paid for them in 1958 and 1959. 
I think one um, one was when he bought, he bought for a few thousand dollars and it sold for seventy five thousand dollars and and you know another one sold for one hundred twenty five thousand dollars for against very much much lower purchase prices. The sale, the total sale, which happened to have been the first single owner sale at auction was almost $2.5 million, which is an enormous sum in 1973. And at the end of the sale, Rauschenberg, Rauschenberg approached Skull and said, the least you could do, you know, I've been working my ass off all these years for you to make a profit. The least you could do is send every artist in this room free taxis for a week. And Skull replied, but it works for you too, Bob, because now you can charge even higher prices for your, work, your works in the primary market. And um, according to the mildest story that, that, I've, that I've read, <laughs> Rauschenberg shoved a skull, I've heard worse, and, and uh, the two, but the two never spoke again. And the reason for this is because if the resale royalty had existed in, at the, in 1973, then, then Rauschenberg and all the other artists whose works were sold that evening, including Twombly and Warhol and, 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 other, and other very well-known artists would have been able to realize a, um, a, a royalty based on the gain of, of, the, of, of these works. That, I mean, that's, that's basically the, the, the argument, um, but, you know, but, but realistically, and we've discussed this a little bit on the side, um, the the beneficiaries of such a of such a law would be the would be the artists at the very top echelon of the market whose works are actually resold. Most artists, you know, have a hard time selling their work in the primary market, let alone in the secondary market. Um, the bill that Nadler's proposing would apply at least for now. If it if it passed, it would apply only in the um, it would apply only to auction houses whose sales the previous year <clears throat> exceeded $1 million. It wouldn't apply to, um, to, um, to galleries, private sales, at least for now. In Europe, this, um, there are over 70 countries in the world that do have a resale royalty, in, including all of the European Union member states. Who, um, which were required by a directive in 2001 to, um, to they're mandated to require to, to pass a resale royalty law in their in their country, and and the UK was the was the last one to um, to be in compliance, and now all of the, and that was in 2006, and now all of the countries are in compliance. So the um, so there there are many arguments for and you know for and against resale royalties, and and this is a debate that's going. To, Going to continue. I might also add that um, that from a from a copyright perspective, um, this is th this um, the resale royalty is a is a is really a kind of moral right. It it relates to the uh, personality of the artist that um, that that is that continues in the art. It, and it's the United States has a has a different um, copyright regime, which is based on an economic incentive to create. It's, um, it's based in the Constitution. The, the, to, the purpose of copyright is to promote science, it's, it's the progress of science and the useful arts. And by, by giving a, you know, a, a, re, a reward for, for creating works and getting works into the public domain. So this is, a, this is not really part of the U.S. copyright philosophy or tradition as it is in Europe, which is, which is fundamentally based on authors. Um, the personality of the, of the artist injects his spirit into the art. So they're, 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 they're quite divergent. But um, the United States has only one state that, um, that, has, that has had a resale royalty, and that's California. And that, that state uh, passed its law um, following this skull sale, actually. Um, there was some movement, and the, the, bill, the, the bill passed. And, but over the years, it was hardly really used, and very, really hardly people didn't really know about it. And sometimes it would cost m more money to find the artist than, than, the, than the, the money that that artist would receive. 
So they're, you know, they're very high costs, and, and you know, um, and that bill has been challenged. There's been a, a, um, a class action lawsuit spearheaded by Chuck Close and some other artists and estates claiming that they were, they're owed resale royalties on sales that took place in New York. The, but the owner, the, the, the owners, the seller was from California. And that case was decided um, in the district court. The district court found that they, the, the, um, the law was unconstitutional because the, because it, it, it um, conflicted with the, with the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution that, that states that only Congress can um, regulate interstate commerce. And that, um, there's been an appeal which was just argued last month before the Ninth Circuit. There's actually a re-argument on Bach, which is the entire, entire court. And so we'll wait and see to see if, um, if, if, that, um, if, if the California resale royalty um, will still um, be in effect. Um, I think it's going to pass. Um, the, the federal resale royalty? Well, I mean, at, at this state, it's going to be reintroduced, and, and Congressman Nadler is very enthusiastic about it. He does have support. Um, in, I think he has 15 co-sponsors, but don't quote me on that. I'm not, I'm not absolutely positive. But he gave a very, very um, um, lively uh, uh, presentation uh, before a group of copyright lawyers and, um, and he's very enthusiastic about it. Um, given the fact that we're in a year and a half away from an election, I, I don't know if there's, you know, if it's realistic that this would gain the traction, but um, this is not the first time there has been a resale royalty bill proposed, and, um, and it's not his first time either proposing such a bill, but, um, but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting debate. I don't know how you feel about this. Well, I, I, I find it interesting that copyright is a very strange animal because most of the people producing artistic works tend to be left of center, liberal. But you can still go to Congress and go to some of the more conservative uh, uh, Congress, uh, representatives and talk about copyright in terms of property ownership. And, it, and you can often get a strange overlap. Mm -hmm. I'd like to open this up to the audience now. Does anybody have questions for any of our panelists? Mm -hmm. I am so glad that I came here tonight. <laughs> I was getting ready to make a lot of mistakes. Huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just overwhelmed. I'm a writer. Mm. I'm also a 501c3. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written a musical and I have a t shirt. It's just so complicated. Okay. I have a phrase that I trademarked and I have an artist work with me to put on the t-shirt. And this is the logo of your musical? Is that where? Uh, I, well, I thought I was, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, it has a different name, but I was going to sell the t-shirt with this, but I, I designed it telling her very specifically what I want to. Uh, uh, you know, it's trademarked, so it's on the shirt. And I wanted it sold not only with the musical, but because the phrase is so unique, I was looking to attach it to uh, like a Kellogg or a uh, McDonald's or something like uh, that. Do I own, okay, in that I designed this and told us specifically what I want and it has my trademark on it, do I own it or does she? I would say, well, it sounds like you don't have a written agreement with her. No, so, so, so it sounds like you probably don't. Work for hire only exists in two circumstances. One is uh, if you're an employer and employee relationship and you probably weren't providing her with an office space, paying, you know, withholding taxes, paying a, into a pension plan. Right, so she was an independent contractor. So you would have to have a written contract with her that said it was a work for hire. So right there you're kind of, it, it, you're, you're in murky waters at best. And a work for hire actually only applies to nine categories, and I'm going to give it a shot. Supplemental, compilation, collective works, 
uh, textbook, text uh, exam questions, text an uh, answers to those questions, uh, audio-visual work, like a motion picture, uh, um, a translation, and an atlas. Is that? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> so, so, so as you can tell, uh, graphic work, whether for a canvas or a t-shirt, uh, isn't one of those nine categories, even if you had that, that contract. Um, you could argue an implied license, but, uh, you know, it's going to, I think at the end of the day, it's going to depend on your relationship with that artist and what, and what the mutual, what mutual understanding you can, you can suss out of her and put in writing now. Okay. If I, okay. But would I be in the position to now attach it, uh, like kind of deal with a, say, McDonald's? Well, no, once you, I mean, I think everyone here will agree, will say, if you start making millions of dollars on this, she's going to be one of several people who come out of the woodwork with their hands out. Well, uh, no, it's not, I don't know that the musical, I mean, you, I don't know that the not-for-profit owns the musical. Uh, I don't... I, I thought that I wanted to put it on the non for profit only because in working with producers, I'm a good deal. They don't lose money. They can invest in me and write me off. Well, yeah, but <coughs> well no, I mean, it's the, and there are laws against not for profits working with for profit entities as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can I can give you my card because it's gonna this is <laughs> and, and, and talk about it. It, it is, it's 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 Nelson and and I'm happy to talk about it more with you. There's also the issue of joint works, um, you know, joint copyright. Um, sometimes um, two people, two or more people, work on a work on a creative work, and and um, and but a joint work has to. The, the parties have to intend for it to be a joint work. Yeah. For it to be a joint work. To, join, to have joint authorship of a work. Okay, so then also, say in this particular instance, I did the book and the lyrics. Just one more question. I did the book and the lyrics, but I worked with an arranger and the person that does the music. Would I owe them uh, uh, money from the sale of this? Yeah. Because it's being sold with you. Oh, for. I need to go. Sounds like it. If one posts an image on the internet somewhere, how does that affect the cop clock with respect to copyright registration? Uh, how does it affect the clock? I mean, it's lifetime plus 70 years. Yeah, so it, in terms of infringement, three months of publishing. Oh, yeah, that would be considered publication. Posting accounts, publication. Absolutely. Yeah, that's publication. Does that include your own website? Mm-hmm. If your website's public. What about if you're trying to resell artwork that you own? Does that count? Would that be any violations of copyright rules? What do you mean by that you own? That you created? No, no, or? that you purchased from, like, you... You bought a work of art and you want to sell it? And you want to sell it like eBay. All these people who put works on eBay for resale, um, are they, you know, infringing on copyright law? They, uh, by the by, the fact of, of, um, of posting a, an, an image of, what, of the work they're selling, um, I haven't, you know, I mean, I haven't seen any, any, any litigation on that. I mean, I think that, you know, you're, of course, you're allowed to resell a work. That's the, that's the first sale doctrine. There's a doctrine in copyright law that states that you know if you own a, if you own something, you can resell it. You can you can sell the work. But you're you're talking about put, putting an image up of what you're of what you're selling for the purpose of selling it. What do you think? Well, this is not. I'm gonna I'm gonna disclaim. Yeah, disclaim. But you know, <laughs> on one side down the other, but. That I would think it's like a, a transformative use, saying, I'm not really posting this picture for the enjoyment of the aesthetic, I'm posting it for a marketing purpose yeah, to, like a to, to, to sell it. Yeah. 
I mean, it's not it's it's not going to um, it, it's not going to substitute for the the original, and it can't. It's it's going to be a very low resolution. Um, it it could probably and it's for a different purpose. Right, entirely. exactly. So, uh, but you know, I, I, that's a very general statement about yeah. a very vague question. You know, we haven't seen what you're talking about exactly. So. Yeah. Two more questions. Hey. Yeah. And then Margo. Yeah, my question is about uh, visual arts and contracts between the artist and the dealer or the gallery. And I was just wondering, in your experience, would you be able to give maybe bullet points of what are things that an artist should be looking for in that they should definitely be on that contract? And what things might show up that an artist should see as a red flag and say, you know, looking out for that. Okay, well, um, um, it's all in here. Judith and I did a, a, a panel <laughs> together right. where, oh, where right. uh, yes. I, I, I submitted a, for as part of the materials, I, I submitted this gallery contract that was on LexisNexis. It was on this thing that all lawyers use. Yes. And, I, and I said, there's something funny about the copyright here. I, I was surprised to see that. And, and Judith actually had the juice to call up to Lexus That's Nexus right, and yes. say, the gallery can't take the copyright. You have to take that down. And Lexus okay. Nexus took it yeah, down. Yeah, they took it down. Judith. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> something that you, that would be a red flag. Yeah. That, you know, okay. that would be a red flag. The other the other um, issue to, to point out is that under New York's Arts and Cultural Affairs Law, an artist who delivers works of art to a gallery who is a merchant deals in goods of that kind. It's a definition under the Uniform Commercial Code. That those those works are deemed a consignment by operation of law, yeah. even without a signed writing. There, there's they are they are you wouldn't have to really worry too much about. Uh, I mean, because by operation of law, an artist delivering works of art to a gallery um, would. Would be um, would, would be deemed a consignment, and there's also a, a dealer who is going to withhold your works and not return them. That is a violation. That is that is a that is fiduciary obligation that the works are held in trust for the benefit of the artist, and the proceeds are also held in trust for the benefit of the artist. In fact, now a failure to to uh, separate the funds, the proceeds from the operating expenses of the gallery is a violation, and it's, it, it rises to the level of a misdemeanor. So, um, so it, a dealer who refuses to return works of art to an artist, um, say the artist leaves and wants to go to another dealer, say the, uh, the, the dealer has advanced funds to the artist, that's a separate. That, that is a separate cause of action. Uh, the dealer would would have to return the works, cannot offset any amounts, and would be required and, and, and could would have to sue the artist for for um, you know for a breach of contract. But um, so and you what, want that in the contract, even even yeah. though it might be yes. a function of law, you yes, want to be on the right. same page as the dealer to get ahead of the problem before you you know become enemies, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's and right. Insurance, insurance. Yeah, the other thing, yeah, the other uh, other issues you want to be very clear about is, um, you know, how many how many um, exhibitions are, are is the is the dealer going to hold um, a year? Um, are they going to um, are, are they going to pay for shipping and insurance? When does the insurance begin? Um, when you know when will you be paid? How often can you look at the, how often can you examine the books? Um, what you know, what is the percentage? Yeah, discounts. I'm very glad you mentioned that. Yes, discounts. Um, is is the gallery allowed to discount um, your you know sales of your work, and, and, and are you allowed to sell on your own um, through your your studio? You would want to know if this is the exclusivity is this an exclusive power to sell? There. Now it gets to a real estate yeah. contract. In other words, if you sell out of your studio, does that mean that you have to pay the dealer, even though the dealer may have had nothing to do with that sale? Or is it an exclusive agency? What, what is the territory? Does the, does the dealer have 
the rights in, in the United States and another dealer has the rights in, in the UK? Or, or is there the East Coast, West Coast? Or, or, is, or is it in terms of medium? Does this, does this dealer deal in your works on paper and, and, and painting? And then another dealer works with sculpture of your works? So you want to you want to spell all this out so it's really very clear. How long is it going to last? That's another issue. How long is how long is this going to last? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to be two years um, or is it going to be five years? I'm or arguing with a dealer right now over territory who's insisting on getting worldwide territory. And what I told him is like, look, those are those, that's a big boy get, <laughs> and you're not the Gagosian. You're not a big boy. You're not. You're not uh, providing the big boy give to the artist, uh, so so it's also not just looking at the territories. It's also what that, in, you know, every deal is different. Yeah. This this person has has uh, connections in Croatia. This person has them in South Africa, and this person has them in New Zealand. So one more yeah. question you had, Mark. Yeah, I I think one might overlap. If a person buys art from a gallery, and then person wants to resell it because they were time they're changing their mind they don't want it to work. Can they just go about selling it? Would they do it privately? If they want to do it privately, or go do they have to then find out if the artist is alive and then the artist gets well, there's no, there's no resale royalty right in New York State, and there's no federal resale royalty right. So the, the, the seller would not, would not be required to pay any resale royalty to the, to the artist unless there was a contract. That states that you would you you would have that would have to be by you know by private agreement. From a gallery or here at an auction, and you want to now eventually sell it. I mean, it, it depends on your on your. I bought whatever the name of the piece has to pay for, but it doesn't have the copyright. Nothing. Well, there's, if there's no restriction on sale, um, then, uh, such as the restriction we were speaking about with, with, the, with the Popeye work, that right. there's a restriction on sale for five years. And so, yeah, well, so Perelman would, would not be allowed to resell that work for five right. years because I guess th there was a it was, it was actually a little more complicated. Uh -huh. It was Gagosian had committed not to sell right. it for five right. years. Right. So Perelman could have sold it any time. And if it's, if it's your, in, in, a sense, yeah. in this sense, it's your asset, it's your property. You can sell. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes if you buy through a gallery, they may want to. They have the, you know, the right of first refusal, but that would be in a, that would be in a contract. Um, of course, you can sell works, you know, privately without going to a dealer. Um, but a buyer, um, you know, who goes to a dealer, um, who's a merchant, is protected under under the Uniform Commercial Code that you know on on authenticity and and. Um, and other warranties, uh, warranty of title, warranty of authenticity, um, that, um, that, you know, that's, so, yeah, so, I don't know, I've answered your question. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming tonight. I hope you've got Thank you.